we are jumping into our next session with James Smith about application performance management does not equal application stability management. Um, and so to jump right in, if you have ever tried to hammer a nail with maybe a pair of pliers, or if you've ever really tried to do anything with the wrong tool, the experience you probably felt uh, was probably horribly inefficient. It was probably extremely frustrating because you're using the wrong tool. In this session, you'll learn the difference between application performance management and application stability management uh, and the different solutions and how you can improve the end user experience by using the right tools. So let me introduce you to our speaker, James Smith. James is the CEO and co-founder of Bugsnag. Prior to joining Bugsnag, James was the CTO at HeyZap and was instrumental in scaling HeyZap from a three-person company to the world's largest mobile gaming community and mobile ads platform. James has also worked at Bloomberg and has created a number of popular open source projects, which are used by companies such as Twitter, Pinterest, and Trello. Be sure to check him out on GitHub at LoopJ. Um, and so with that, I'd like to say, welcome back, James. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for having me again. Let's see here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I uh, Patrick gave me a great intro there. Um, all right, let me get my my screen presented here so we're all set up well. Okay, and then let's do this. Great. Okay, so today, as Patrick said, I'm going to be talking about um, the differences between. Uh, application stability management and application performance management, because these are not the same thing. Uh, before I dive into that, I talk a little bit about myself. Um, as Patrick mentioned, uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Bugsnag. Um, and really, I'm a builder. That's what's in my DNA. Um, I love building products. And these days, I spend most of my time uh, building companies. And, and, and Bugsnag is, uh, I've been running for the last seven years. Um, before I became a CEO, I was uh, formerly a CTO and uh, joined a Y Combinator company in 2009, which brought me out to the Bay Area um, and uh, ran that team uh, uh, from three people in a bedroom to uh, a, a really popular uh, mobile social network uh, for, for gamers. Uh, I also used to do a lot of open source work. Uh, I built one of the first um, uh, callback driven HTTP clients for Android, which was used by pretty much every app back in the day. Uh, don't use it these days. There's much better alternatives these days. Um, and then before that, I used to uh, build uh, little widgets and and uh, and things uh, for JavaScript applications like sliders and and uh, autocomplete dropdowns, all that kind of stuff. But these days, again, there's, there's better tools available, but that's my background. Um, I also have a background in enterprise. I worked at Bloomberg for a number of years building uh, trading platforms uh, for the foreign exchange space, which was which was uh, also pretty fun. Um, these days, as I said, I'm uh, running a company called Bugsnag. Bugsnag is uh, what we call an application stability management platform. Uh, basically, what that means is we'll detect when your software breaks automatically uh, when it's in the hands of your customers. So we'll detect crashes, um, unhandled signals, um, unhandled exceptions, we'll, we'll detect all sorts of stuff, even in JavaScript land, we'll catch unhandled promise rejections, but basically anything that can cause your application uh, to give your customers a bad experience, we'll detect that and help you uh, figure out how to fix it. Um, and we've been doing this for a while, we've been doing this for about seven years, uh, and over those last seven years, we're, we're very proud to uh, name these uh, companies as customers, um, uh, of order from uh, little SMBs using us all the way up to Bay Area unicorns or more traditional uh, companies that are differentiating via technology. So today I want to talk about what we call application stability management, which I think is a little bit different to what most people are used to. Uh, you almost certainly are using something like log management solution, like a Splunk. You almost certainly are using something like an APM product, like an AppDynamics or a New Relic. But there's this different thing. Um, we call it application stability management, but really what it is, is reflecting the, the changes and evolution in software development. So this is all obvious to pretty much every engineering leader that, that, that's watching. Uh, it used to be uh, that you, uh, even when I first started my career, you release a piece of software, you would print it to a DVD or CD and ship it to Best Buy uh, and people would buy it. And that was it. Your software was out and released and there was no changes to it. 
but obviously we live in a different world now. Pretty much every piece of software that's being built um, has some kind of uh, update cycle or it's, it's connected product. Uh, or, or in a lot of cases in the SaaS world, um, it's software that is, is updated uh, in real time. You might wake up the next day and there's a new feature there. And there's, so that's kind of the, the new world we're in, but also there's lots of um, uh, evolution in the way teams are structured uh, uh, a lot of the time especially in mobile software development the people who are building the software are also responsible for releasing the software it used to be that maybe you'd have, have um, your devops team or, or, or infra team be involved in rollouts of, of, of new versions but actually on the client side more often than not there's this emerging role called release manager which typically sits on the engineering or product team rather than on the infrastructure team or devops team and so you the engineering team is much more involved in in the releasing of the app and they own the code that they've written for longer it's not like you you write the code and ship it and it's gone you own it for the full life cycle of your software um there also used to be a strong focus especially in apm land on performance uh, mainly on server side you'd care a lot about how much this was costing you uh, to uh, how much it was costing you to uh, to spend in cloud spend? You're, you're spending a lot of money on AWS. Maybe we should tweak, tweak that performance to make it a bit faster. But these days, I think more what's more important is the, the end user experience. And I already talked about infrastructure centric versus application centric trends as well. I'm sure a lot of you are seeing these in your teams as well. So we kind of need a bit more of a, a, a shift in focus. If historically we cared more about the the uh, the the, the computers and the machines that software was running on. And these days we're shifting to care about this, uh, the more about the customer experience. Uh, we need to consider the trade-offs and really the trade-offs are pretty straightforward. Um, you want to deliver features to your customers on a sensible pace. You want to get features to your customers as soon as reasonably possible. Um, now, how do you decide what is reasonably possible? Well, you have to make sure that you're not delivering terrible crap quality software to your customers, but you also don't want your lunch to get eaten by your competitors. A really good example here is the trade-off that um, I saw with Lyft and Uber a few years ago. Um, uh, Lyft and Uber, it, it turns out, were both working on um, their uh, shared ride functionality, Uber Pool or Lyft Line, it was called at the time, at exactly the same time. And uh, it seems like the, the Lyft Line launched one day after Uber Pool. And whether that was because Uber got all the press and launched their feature quickly and Lyft felt they had to react or whether it was just a coincidence, I don't know. But these are the kind of competitive tensions that exist in, 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 most, uh, in most software teams. So how can we measure that? How can we figure out when is the right time to deliver our software? When is the right time to ship software to our customers? So uh, it used to be uh, that we would go and look at APM products. Or maybe we would go into log management solutions um, and dig around in the code after a customer had complained to us. And it actually shocks me how common this is still these days, the amount of people who wait for customers to complain, then start digging into, uh, into issues. Well, that APM focus, obviously a lot of people come from that, from that, from that path. You'd start off at the, the infrastructure layer uh, with monitoring of CPU and memory usage. Uh, and, oh, have I run out of disk space? is my server going to fall over? Uh, and then the database layer at the top, maybe that would be your um, DBAs working on your infra team. And then finally, you'd get up into the code layer and then closer to the customer layer. Now, that makes sense. That's how things used to be run. And when things were, uh, DevOps and infrastructure teams were purely owning uh, the running of applications, uh, then this kind of made sense, which is why I think APM has been so prevalent. So it's great. I'm not saying don't use APM. APM is an essential tool. You can figure out when your infrastructure is falling over, you can figure out when you need to scale, uh, you can figure out when uh, there are performance bottlenecks, uh, you can do capacity planning, uh, response times, load times, you know, all of these metrics you need to care about as, a, as an infrastructure team and as a development team. Um, but it's not necessarily tied to customer experience. Um, I like to talk about uh, this example. Uh, Patrick mentioned about um, use the right tool for the job. Another analogy we like to use is, look, what's the point in tuning your engine on your Lamborghini if you've got four flat tires? Like, honestly, there are teams out there that are, are, are tuning performance characteristics uh, uh, while the application is failing for key flows or key experiences in their product. And so that's kind of where application stability management comes in, as we call it 
try and focus on the customer experience first. Where are the places in your application that customers are seeing a demonstrably bad experience? And so really what we talk about here is flipping that pyramid. It's exactly the same elements in this pyramid, but let's start from the top and work down. So if your aim as a product and engineering team is to deliver features that add value to your customers that they're going to get excited about and pay you money for, which is true in any environment, then let's focus on the customers first. So if you're going to do that, you need to figure out, are my customers having a problem-free experience rather than what's my CPU usage on average over the, over the last thousand requests or whatever app decks or whatever uh, uh, they use over uh, in the new uh, APM space. Well, let's think about customers. Well, let's think about, are they having a stable experience? Or do they have flat tires on their Lamborghini? Um, let's figure out uh, what the client side looks like first as a leading indicator of problems. And let's make sure that we're fixing problems in a timely fashion and we're fixing the right problems first. Now, I'm not wearing my uh, bug snag t-shirt today, but on my bug snag t-shirt, it says, don't fix every bug. Not every bug needs fixing. And you know, when I started my career, I'd be like, whoa, you can't say that. But now I've run large engineering teams and I'm sure a lot of people will be agreeing with this. You have to prioritize. You have to be ruthless about which bugs matter. Another interesting trend that I'd like to bring up at this point in time is the role of QA. Now, it, historically, when I started my career, QA used to be this human powered function. You'd have tens, hundreds of people, maybe thousands in some companies, whose job it was to bust open a, a Microsoft Word document and go through a list, uh, a script of things they had to do in your software to make sure it was working as expected. Now, a lot of teams still do that. There's a lot of money spent on human powered uh, QA. But what we're seeing is actually this is getting squeezed from both sides of the software development lifecycle. Now, the most obvious one, I think, is from the left hand side of the software development lifecycle. Um, why, why should we have humans clicking on buttons and go, running through test scripts if we can automate that? So most people watching this, I really hope you have adopted uh, linting, static analysis, uh, unit testing, integrated testing, you've got code coverage measurement, and you're running that all through some CI CD pipeline. If you're doing that, you probably are taking a lot of the grunt work away from QA. But on the right hand side as well, um, making sure that customers don't see a bad experience. Well, sometimes things are going to slip through the crack, even if you are spending, you know, hundreds of hours on QA. And so you need to know when demonstrably, when your software is in the hands of your customers, is it working? Yes or no. And so that balance is really important to strike. I think most people are doing the left-hand side. And what we're seeing is most people are now adopting some kind of production awareness, data-driven approach to figuring out which bugs to fix first, which is, again, what we call application stability management, because it's from the, the, the side of customers. So again, we're talking about a different audience here. We're not talking about DevOps and infrastructure and sysadmins. We're talking about way closer to the customer. We're talking about product teams and engineering teams and the evolution of QA to QE. Uh, I met um, with uh, uh, some of the teams at Capital One a, a couple of years ago, and they, they'd they rebranded their QA team to the QE team, quality engineering. I'm not sure if they still call it that, but uh, that really resonated with me. Quality still matters. I joke, I joke and say QA is dead, long live quality. Um, quality still matters, but it needs to evolve to, to, to surface the information to the right teams. So if you are thinking about this for engineering and product teams, what do you need to do? Well, you need to give the context behind the errors. You need to give that detail at the line of code level. You need to figure out how to prioritize these things and, and teach engineering managers, engineering teams, and triage teams how to figure out which bugs matter first. And you're going to focus on that positive customer experience. And the kind of stuff you're going to care about as an engineer and a product team is what we call a stability score. A lot of teams might call it an error rate. Um, how fast you're delivering features and software to your customer base if you're a mobile team, you might be looking at app store ratings. You know, uh, a, a customer of ours that, that, that joined us a couple of years ago started off, uh, joined Bugsnake. They had a one star rating on the app store. Uh, this is a big consumer brand that you would have heard of. Uh, and now they have a 4.5 star rating on the app store because they have visibility into the bugs that were causing customer impacting problems. And maybe you're looking at CSAT as well. What's the satisfaction of your, of your customer base? So look, most teams have probably adopted some data-driven approach here. A lot of teams use something like error rates. Um, what we've done at Bugsnag is we've collect that automatically. We'll tell you what percentage of sessions ended in an exception, a crash, a bug, whatever, um, and what percentage of sessions did not end in, in that. And that's what we call our, our stability score. Um, we also now tell you what percentage of customers, daily active users, 
uh, saw a bug or didn't see a bug. So you end up with what we call the stability score, which is you know one minus crash user sessions over total user sessions times 100. So we baseline it from 100. Then you can say things like, hey, we have five nines uh, of uh, stability if you're a really good engineering team, or we have three nines of stability. Then you can set goals. You can say, what's our target uh, uh, stability and what's our um, uh, critical stability? So target stability is like, hey, we're really aspiring for this number. Critical stability is everything is on fire. We need to stop the, uh, working on features and we need to get involved in fixing the bugs that are causing the highest impact to our customers. So again, rather than looking at like um, uh, aggregates and averages, you take this information and say, okay, now which bug should I fix? And then you end up uh, being able to be super data driven. You be able to, you're, you're in control of your customer experience and your engineering team can figure out how to balance bug fixes with features, which is the dream. It shouldn't be guessing. You shouldn't be waiting for customers to complain. You shouldn't be spending hundreds of hours on human powered QA. You should be trying to squish out all bugs, as, as many bugs as possible during your pre-production phase, uh, linting, static analysis, uh, making sure you've got code coverage for unit and integration tests um, and running that all through CI CD. Hopefully people are almost 100% adopting those techniques. If you're not, go for it. But then making sure nothing slips through the cracks. So the good news about a company like Bugsnag is um, people will say what happens, uh, investors mostly, non-technical people will say what happens when your customers fix all their bugs. And I'm happy to, to say that, that I don't see a world where that happens anytime soon. So you just need to acknowledge that bugs will slip through to your production environment, your custom facing environment. But you don't have to fix all of them. Fix the ones that are costing the most money and revenue. Fix the ones that are impacting the most customers. And be really smart about it. So uh, that's uh, that's my talk. I'd uh, I'd love to uh, kind of hand back out to Patrick. Thank you so much, James. Um, that was that was fantastic. Um, I know that Bugsnag is also joining us tomorrow to host a workshop about creating a culture of code ownership and about improving developer productivity. And so I know that we're excited about that. Um, so thank you, thank you, James, for for jumping in and and sharing your insights. We appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs>